uh, acting as uh, the parenthesis uh, between all these talks. I, uh, I started with uh, talking a lot about uh, affair, and, uh, uh, but uh, from uh, my very heart, I'm uh, a panda person. That's uh, why I'm also a spokesperson, and I'm uh, very much in love in uh, hadron spectroscopy. And one important aspect of hadron spectroscopy, apart from what uh, Uli mentioned already on, on Tuesday, is uh, everything which goes along with exotic germonium as one piece of information to unravel what we call the QCD spectrum. And uh, that's what I want to emphasize a little bit on in terms of the ongoing uh, discussion and discoveries and uh, imminent questions which uh, still have to be asked about the X, Y, and Z, the so-called exotic alphabet, uh, as it was mentioned in several uh, conferences over the last decades. But since I want to have this a little bit also as an educational uh, uh, presentation also to students and also to the people who are excellent physicists but not very much trained in our field, I want to give some uh, introduction on um, what this is all about, why the spectrum is interesting and, and things like that. And then this is also in the record of this uh, conference so that you can uh, look that up if you want to have some information later on. So I start the talk exactly like uh, on Monday. So everything is about understanding uh, QCD and it's, uh, the interaction of the very basic particles, the quarks. And uh, we know that is all this uh, glue which is uh, making up the mess. Interestingly, there is only one stable hadron in the world. Uh, you get a lot of them, but nevertheless, it's the only one, the only species which is stable, which is the proton which is interesting by itself. Why is there only one? And uh, although there are so uh, many things going on in the proton, which we still don't understand, uh, you may have heard about all these scattering experiments which tell you ah, there are free partons, but in principle, these free partons are made out of uh, some percentage of U and D quarks, some percentage of SS bar quarks, although they are not partons and not really uh, the constituent uh, particles of this, uh, this proton. So it looks like this is uh, the residual thing which we see, uh, which is unamazingly stable, is the outcome of something which is extremely complex. And we don't know why this complexity uh, brings a lot of states which are hardly stable, uh, which have lifetimes uh, which are uh, so short that you even cannot see the states because they are so broad. And there is this one thing which is uh, stable like hell where we look for the proton decay to understand CPT violation in the world. So that's the basic start of everything. I mentioned also the um, uh, QCD Lagrangian and I want to emphasize more on uh, these additional terms because uh, uh, when we look into QED then uh, we have in principle only the first part but we don't have this self-interaction and this is obviously producing all the mess and independent on uh, which uh, uh, quarks we look at we always get these aspects that uh, uh, there is an enormous amount of energy in addition to the bare quark masses which are in, uh, inherent just uh, by, by the construction. So there is additional energy which, if it would be in QED, would just dissolve this object. Because in QED, we have bound systems which always have negative binding energy. Here we put energy on top to actually get it bound. This is something strange and which is the feature of QCD. Everybody here knows that. I just want to emphasize uh, why this is so uh, interesting and how you can convey this, for example, also to other people who are not from this field, that uh, they really understand what the important feature here is. And um, when you start out with the proton, then this is what we call a, a normal conventional hadron, because it's made out of uh, uh, quarks which underlie the very simple rule, either you put three quarks into one object or you take a quark and an antiquark, where the antiquark mathematically is in principle nothing else than a diquark because you have this threefold charge uh, which we call color. Uh, but in principle, at least from just simple-minded counting of colors, uh, 
and, uh, and properties of the, of the quarks, not looking at, on how the actual binding would take place, how potentials uh, would be created and things like that. You can imagine that there are in principle a lot of things which you can play with. Like with a Lego system, you can uh, put a, a lot of components together and starting out with mesons and baryons, just to put the smallest representation of these classes here in a, in a cartoon, uh, you could think about uh, what happens if I have two Lego pieces which are only which are bound by by some spiral which uh, is vibrating. Yeah, this brings additional energy into the system and therefore different eigenstates. That's what we call hybrids because they are somehow made out of constituents like the, uh, the normal mesons, but they have additional degrees of freedom. So they are hybrids, chimeres, or something like that. Then the glue balls, which uh, Uli taught, uh, talked about, no constituent uh, uh, quark at all. Only the excitation of the QCD vacuum is uh, playing a role here, and uh, we have seen uh, very interesting uh, uh, ideas how to, how to deal with that, also in string theory. And the huge field of everything which has more uh, quarks in it than you actually would need to have the simplest flavor blind, uh, color blind, uh, system, and that we call molecules, multiquarks, tetraquarks, uh, dimesons. There is a whole zoo of particles which, in principle, are uh, distinguished by what is actually bound in first order and in second order. So a molecule, uh, I, I'm a little bit colloquial here, nevertheless, uh, molecules are more or less, you have, in principle, uh, a valid uh, QCD system already on one side and on the other side like in deuterium, where you have the neutron and the proton, and there is some loose binding in between. That's in gross uh, uh, features what we call a molecule. If all binding is um, uh, more or less democratic, so that you really cannot make a distinction on uh, a group of quarks within this uh, setup, then you get something like a multi-quark. And there are all varieties in between, and the naming convention is not really clear, so you always have to say what you mean, but it tells you uh, that you have, in principle, a whole zoo of isomers as soon as you have a certain amount of uh, quarks in, in, in this bag with various ordering mechanisms, which binding is stronger and uh, gives the substructure and which binding is more loose and gives the overall structure. So, and. When we want to understand what binding is doing, then I already said in, on Monday, it's important to look on the cases where binding is hardly possible at the extreme cases uh, to understand how they behave, because we did uh, spectroscopy and uh, interaction dynamics 50 years on particles uh, which are simpler, and we now have to get to the step further because we got almost everything out of the classical systems. Now we have to see how we can complement this with uh, these exotic systems. And uh, also this is a little bit colloquial and uh, our theory colleagues may uh, 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 give apologies. Uh, the point is when we look onto these exotic systems, then they are in principle uh, something which we can call material science of hadrons. Because what do we do if we do spectroscopy? Yeah, it's not just simply counting states and looking at their properties. If you translate this into uh, the normal uh, construction of a brick wall, yeah, then the QQ bar state is a brick wall, which also explains why you need glue in order to get it stable, because two bricks plus glue is more heavy than the two in individual bricks. So we are very close to that picture. And what does it mean? So first we can excite this, uh, this quark, anti-quark pair by putting a radial excitation in, so we make it longer and longer and longer, so we stretch the material. We can uh, put some, no, that's a higher uh, 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 excitation. This is higher radial excitation, so you bring some twist in that and look uh, how long you can do that until the wall breaks. Uh, then you can exchange the bricks. That's when you go from pions to kaons to charmonium to whatever, and look what it are the criteria of stability of that kind. Molecules would be, for example, a, a wall uh, of bricks of second order. So you have, in principle, smaller pieces which are made out of bricks, which you then combine to a larger thing. 
you have the hybrids, which get the vibration. So the wall is vibrating here and there, uh, like in an earthquake. Then you have the vibrations of that kind for the hybrids. That's also earthquake-like. Or you go from a brick wall to pure concrete, which has no bricks at all, and that's a glue wall. So it's material science what we are doing if we investigate all these states. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. The main point is, uh, because of the self-interaction and many other aspects of this non-abelian theory, is that as soon as you have a normal meson, there is, because of this very high coupling constant, uh, zillions of possibilities to have in the wave function uh, to arrive finally at the QQ bar pair again, all kinds of intermediate states, which in principle are nothing else than mixing of two states which have the same quantum numbers and approximately the same mass, so that you in principle mix them all together. So you have bare states, you have mixed states, and depending on how many you put into that, uh, they uh, change the spectrum quite dramatically. Yeah? We know this from k log and k short, or the, the, the B system, where you in principle have then the bare SU3 states for the K, and then have the two ones which you actually measure. Yeah, the more you put in, the more you get out. So if you really would put in uh, uh, to the QQ bar meson four different uh, other states of different kind, yeah, then you also get more out, but in a completely different pattern because the mixing uh, scenario then tells you which one has how much of which component. And this makes the story very, very complicated. In particular, in light quark spectroscopy, if the states are really overlapping uh, uh, heavily and the width are also uh, uh, comparably large, then it's almost impossible to really disentangle such a picture in uh, prominent quantum numbers like the scalars. Uh, it's not so clear if it's possible with the tensors, just because there is so much going on that distinguishing an exotic thing from a non-exotic thing is very, very complicated. And this was the initial idea why we invented Panda at the very, very beginning, end of the 90s. Because uh, there are, two, uh, in principle, two things which you can do. One is just to forbid all the states on top. Yeah, so you cut away the QQ bar by requesting quantum numbers which are not possible for QQ bar. So you still don't know which kind of exotic it is, but you know it's mandatory exotic because the wave function cannot, uh, uh, cannot have a QQ bar pair. That's one thing, and this, is, uh, this was already done uh, in the light quark sector in the 90s. And there were some candidates, so this was uh, 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 very, very interesting and also serving the case. The other thing is, what you can do is, uh, uh, no, that's a different thing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's how you find the uh, exotic quantum numbers. For example, this is one of many models how to create, for example, hybrids. And uh, this shows you that in the ground state, non nets of those hybrids, you actually create quantum numbers which are not QQ bar-like. So that's an idea how, how one can uh, attack this. But what you also can do is uh, you can go into CC bar. Because of the charmonium system uh, being having a completely different level density, uh, a lower level density and more narrow states, if you find something exotic, it will be an isol isolated finding, or the mixture will only be among very few states, but not everything. And that's what we are actually seeing. Yeah? With XYZ, you see zillions of states, and they are all distinct, not like in uh, uh, light quark physics, where they would all overlap because of the width. And this is, for example, a calculation from the lattice where one would have to look at. And in principle, the idea is this is the classical QQ bar potential, yeah? uh, non-relativistic because of the heavy uh, quarks, uh, which is not quite true. We know that the, the charm quarks are more relativistic than originally anticipated. So this is just to guide the eye a little bit. But when you do that, then with the additional freedom of having the vibration in the string between the quark and the antiquark, then you may create potentials which look like that. And if you then find bound states in that, that's exactly what you would uh, call hybrid uh, um, uh, eigenstates, which you really could measure in a physics experiment. And these are calculations from the lattice. Oops, so this is already gone. Oh, no, 
not completely, with uh, the normal potential and then potentials which then are hybrid-like. And they go back already 20 years. They are still modern uh, because we still wait for experimental input uh, to stimulate new calculations. Yeah, They're still uh, state of the art. So what we are starting with in the uh, CC bar sector is the simple uh, QCD uh, motivated potential, one over R Coulomb term, and then something which makes sure that the quarks are bound together. That's all textbook uh, uh, knowledge, so nothing really new. Uh, and this builds up a spectrum of particles which are all found, which are very well known, and which lie very nicely on what was predicted. Yeah. Here you see the matching of, the, of these levels with this, and here the green with there. But then there was 2003, and uh, although the B factories have been built for something completely different, Bell was the first to find uh, a charmonium system, or in a reaction which prefers the creation of charmonium in a B decay, which exhibited a width which is in the order of MeV. This is extremely narrow, and nobody expected this to, to happen because this is above the DD bar threshold, so it's like the phi, uh, 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 which is narrow because it's so close to the SS bar threshold, and a more heavier phi would be much, much broader because of the open K on channels, which would then make the lifetime uh, reasonably short and therefore the, the, the width uh, relatively broad. But here, this is not the case. It's extremely narrow. Uh, and it was uh, immediately uh, confirmed by a lot of experiments uh, uh, already in the first years because it was so narrow and therefore the signal was striking and easy to identify. The other important uh, uh, step was then exactly 10 years later, also in a reaction which uh, favors the production of charmonium systems, but with the interesting aspect that looking into a charmonium, the JSI plus additional pions, you find actually a signal which has to have charge, but comes from a reaction which in principle can only produce charmonium. So that's uh, why they called it a charmonium-like structure. It has charge, 3,900 MeV as a mass and uh, uh, reasonable width, not too narrow, but also not too broad, was easily identified and verified then by other experiments. And this is making up a, really an interesting scenario uh, for the future, because uh, although these experiments have found a lot, and you see here only a part of what has actually been found until today, but what we lack completely is any understanding uh, how they are structured, how they can be structured into a spectrum. So to what kind of particles do they belong, to which spectrum can we uh, put them, and so on. So when you look into that, then uh, uh, you see, OK, in yellow, you have the nicely predicted and discovered particles. Uh, there is no big surprise. So because these, uh, the uh, potential is working in principle very, very nice. But then you have all these unpredicted but discovered states. Yeah? And uh, there are a few here in the normal spectrum with normal quantum numbers and, and hidden, uh, um, uh, hidden charge, and therefore hidden stra uh, uh, charm. But also the charge ones here, Z3900, 4020, 4430, and so on. And uh, what can we make out of that? That's the main question. And uh, in order to get uh, some uh, uh, deeper knowledge on what's going on, we certainly have to look not only in order uh, to, uh, not only to uh, look for new states, which is also important, but we also have to investigate the properties of the states which are existing very thoroughly. And Panda is going to follow both parts looking into new states to complement the particles which we have, because uh, Bohr never has, uh, would have uh, discovered the Bohr model by having just one line of transition. You cannot make a 1 over n square law if you don't have at least three states. And that's exactly what is missing here. We have always one state and no picture how to combine them. 
But also, we need to understand these, uh, these states much better, and that's the other way we are focusing on. So what can we do? We have all these exotic things with these uh, hopefully uh, then also exotic quantum numbers at some point. And how to access this? And there is a unique possibility because a proton-antiproton, because of, an, uh, of being extended particles and also extended uh, um, uh, scattering parameters, can produce all quantum numbers a fermion-antifermion -fermion system can build up. There is no, no, uh, no problem to do that. It's just the energy, how many H bar Cs you can invest into your reaction. This then increases the number of uh, angular momentum units which you can put into the system. But then you can break up one particle, and then with almost no angular momentum between this and this, you can produce here whatever high spin you like. So you can go also to very high spin systems without any cost in angular momentum suppression. And because you take away spin, angular momentum, and parity, you can produce, produce any JPC combination which is mathematically possible. So even if this does not reflect to any, any known theoretical uh, uh, idea, uh, you can measure everything here. That's also possible. So that's one thing one can do. And that's uh, obviously uh, the, <clears throat> the technique to make explorative searches. And this we would do, and here I come back to something which also Uli showed. This we will do in principle by looking onto the complete phase space of exclusively reconstructed particles in the final state. To make the thing a little bit more uh, visual and to explain what's going on, you can do that, for example, with three particles, which you always can depict into a two-dimensional plot. And the invariant masses, for example, here the K star in the K, uh, K bar pi invariant mass, appears as a line. The same is true then also in the other coordinate with other pairs, like the pi pi, which you see as a row band. And in addition, if you do the, the algebra, then you find out it's not only the bands, it's also the angular distribution, so the density, the density fluctuation over the band, which tells you about the spin. And if these bands cross, you learn something about the interference. And this is really the important aspect here. It's not only seeing the lines, it's really the interference pattern, because that tells you everything. The interference pattern tells you if this is a resonance or not, or at least if it fulfills all criteria of a resonance. If it's a resonance, I leave to the theorists to, to really find out if this fits into a model and this is a vital state. Nevertheless, we as experimentalists can do as much as possible with such a technique to give you this interference pattern to really unravel this. And uh, as uh, shown uh, uh, on, on Tuesday, this has very much to do with statistics. So I did my PhD work with Crystal Barrel. Uh, this was in, then, uh, with data taken in 1988 and uh, the analysis in 1990. And this was the world statistics of this reaction P by P to 3 pi 0 before we started the experiment. Kalegoropoulos et al. It's a very, very old paper from the beginning of the 70s. So, and this was after the first day of data taking. And this was approximately the amount of data which I had in hand when, I, when we came back from the first beam time. And you see already here, you see very interesting structures. The funny thing is, and that's why it's so uh, intro, uh, uh, introductive, uh, you don't see any bands, really. You see very complicated structures. And you get, uh, see them even better if you go really to high statistics. And then you see here, for example, oops. You see here bands. That's what we have seen before. That's the F0980 as a destructive interference. Or you see here these towers. These are the F2-1270 normal standard meson, but with a, a W-shaped angular distribution with wings which are to the power of four in momentum, and that's why they're so high. And since they are lying in a way that they are constructively interfering at a phase-based boundary, it has a completely different uh, thing uh, compared to, to the bands with, which we have seen. But this gives all this decisive power on the spin and the properties of these particles. And then, for example, uh, this here, 
is the most interesting structure. This band which is going through, which you hardly see, that's the F0-1500. That's what we call a glue ball candidate with a large glue ball admixture, and which was really the new finding within Crystal Barrel, which is now, although uh, kind of exotic, the best measured meson ever, because so many experiments have verified that. But you see this big blob, and this big blob is nothing else than the, inter uh, the interference of one combination of the sigma in pi pi to the other combination of sigma in pi pi. So you see, such a plot can be very complicated and it needs a lot of work to actually unravel this, but it gives you an enormous amount of information. That's how we want to do that with recoil particles. But there is something else, and the other possibility is, since uh, the p by p system uh, has all these uh, possibilities in creating quantum numbers, it has the very big advantage of creating just an interim system, which then decays only to two particles, but still having the p bar p uh, as a reference system for a good spin determination. In addition, uh, the proton, whoops, the proton rests in the, almost in the target, so it has zero momentum with very good precision. And the antiproton is circulating in the orbit. And since it's a storage ring, these antiprotons have to have a very well-defined orbit and very low momentum jitter in order to just keep them in the, the orbit, otherwise they would, would be gone. And this high accuracy of uh, a few 10 to the minus five relative momentum difference give us the opportunity that this detector which we built, in that case, is only responsible for identifying this final state with lowest possible background, but not to use actually the measured momenta to identify the mass of the object. The mass of the object is always uh, what we, uh, is always what we create with the p bar p system. And this gives an enormous handle on uh, the precision measurement of uh, resonances compared to detector-based resolution uh, uh, procedures. Hmm? What are you doing? Does it work anymore? Ah, oh, okay. I don't know if this works. So the problem is uh, this is hard. I had a problem that this was I have the same one at home. It's not really compatible with the Mac. So I do that. I do that by hand, it's much better than. Okay, so the main question is uh, how we actually can do an analysis uh, with uh, such a procedure. And uh, one exercise is, uh, there is this X3872, it is narrow, uh, but First of all, why is it narrow? And what can the property of the X3872 uh, uh, tell us about the nature of it? And already long time ago by Braten, Hanhardt, Kalashnikov, and so on, there are quite a few uh, discussions on how the line shape can be used to identify the nature of the object. And I don't show all possibilities. We did that, for example, for one particular line shape uh, prediction for a model by Kalashnikova. But you could do that uh, for all the cases independently and would always yield in principle the same results, but everything takes time. It's a, it's a tedious analysis, so I show it only for one case and then the uh, conclusions are the same for almost all models. So the basic idea is you have a peak which is almost at threshold. It's not clear if it's above or if it's below, uh, the DD star threshold, uh, and it's al also not clear at the moment how much of the peak is uh, uh, in J psi pi pi below threshold because of dispersive effects, while the, uh, because the DD uh, star threshold is not open, or is this all below threshold and, and uh, uh, has a different nature? So this has to be mapped out, and uh, I want to show you how we actually do that. So one possibility, as I said, is this model of uh, Kalashnikova. Uh, this is just for reference. Uh, I will not explain these formulas. The main point is you can derive line shapes from the model. And you see here, for example, then the different consequences for the J psi 
PyPy channel, the, the one which is most prominent uh, in many uh, uh, detectors and also is very narrow and where it really counts what we can do. And you see, for example, if you have a bound molecule, then you have this nice peak below threshold. And if you have a virtual state, uh, then you have something which is broader, which may have a cusp or not, uh, or a visible cusp. Uh, and that's actually what we have to investigate if this is possible. And it's finally the flat A energy which de determines uh, if this state is one or the other. So a decisive feature at the end is, can we measure this uh, uh, flat A energy? How good can we do that? And how uh, well can we uh, uniquely identify if it's a bound or a virtual state in such a model? So, and <clears throat> here just a, a, a short sketch of uh, how line shapes actually can change depending on what you have. So we have, for, for example, here the bound state uh, on the upper left yeah, with a Fermi energy of minus 14 MeV. It looks more or less like a normal bright Wigner, although it's very narrow. Then you see already some uh, deterioration on the upper right. And then when you go really cross the border to the virtual uh, uh, state, then you see you have uh, something which is a needle. Uh, and uh, or a needle with asymmetric shoulders and the cusp-like stru structure uh, if you even go higher with the Fermi energy. So that's, uh, in principle, the, the power of such an analysis to, to find out what we can do. And uh, here you see some input parameters to the simulation, which are very close to what the detector at the end will deliver. Since we are still optimizing one or the other part of the detector, some of these parameters are still under, float, uh, under floating, uh, because uh, the real detector is always a little bit different than your, uh, than your uh, theoretical optimum and so on. But this gives you the ballpark figure. So you have the typical branching fractions for the JSI going into the dileptons. Uh, you have uh, the branching fractions of the rho and the x3872 to the final states. Uh, you also have to put in what cross-section you anticipate for the production of this object. Since it was not seen in uh, PP bar because there was no PP bar experiment so far, uh, it's very hard to say what the production cross-section is. But there are <coughs> theoretical uh, 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 deductions that it might be in the order of what you see here. And uh, uh, with the input then for the uh, different luminosities. And here are reflected the highest luminosity, which needs also upgrades of the fair machinery. But then the more conservative numbers, uh, high resolution luminosity in the middle with 1368, or uh, something which we have in the very beginning. That's what we call phase one, which is also a little bit lower uh, in terms of effective luminosity, because the detector is not completely uh, for pi. We have some holes here and there because of, uh, of funding, and therefore the effective luminosity is slightly uh, lower. And then you see the resolutions which have been put in or are derived from the simulations, which are, for hadron physics, extremely low because they are in the several 10 or 100 kV regions, uh, which is something which you never find elsewhere in uh, hadron physics of heavy states. So what is the actual method? The actual method is uh, you measure, for example, uh, uh, the exclusive channel J psi pi pi. And what you uh, look into is the spectrum of dilepton pairs. And then you see a peak, uh, a peak which is uh, uh, here uh, drawn in green. And this sits on a background, because there are also other reactions contributing to the background of such a reaction, badly identified electrons and muons, or are just electrons and muons which come from Dalit's decays or other sources in the detector. And since uh, uh, JSI is a rare signal, then also these rare decays of the pions and the kaons contribute to the background. And there's also non-resonant uh, background. That means J size, which come from something else than the X3872, because P by P will produce J psi plus something anyhow, if it's, uh, uh, <clears throat> if it's uh, resonant or not. And uh, in order to find out now the, uh, the signal for the X3872, then you make a fit for each individual bin, 
of the dilepton mass and uh, look for the yield of J size and then you can uh, uh, completely drop the uh, uh, generic background here uh, indicated in red uh, and you will get from the non-resonant background some flat blue uh, background in the residual histogram and then what uh, uh, remains is the signal which you want to investigate. That's a standard technique which is used everywhere and here you see how this looks like. So you see here the various uh, histograms for the different mass spins of uh, uh, the uh, uh, JSI signal. Then you uh, do uh, the different fits and then you see here the lines correspond, uh, the, the arrows correspond to the, to the bins uh, uh, which connect the fit to a plot here. And this would be then the line shape which you have for one Monte Carlo data set. In order to find out what is the resolution at the end, you have to use several Monte Carlo uh, data sets. So we do a toy Monte Carlo uh, more than 100 times to see what is our reproduction uh, uh, error of such a thing. And then you get, for example, for each point, a distribution like that in the lower right, where you then uh, can use that with its errors as the input for your uh, final analysis on the sensitivity of everything. So it's, uh, there's quite a lot of computing overhead into that. In particular, you do that also for various yields and so on. So in principle, you do this, the, the analysis which you would do in the real experiment 10,000 times. And this tells you about the overhead which you have. And so at the end, the uh, decisive feature is uh, can I distinguish between a virtual and a bound state? And for that, we defined, in principle, uh, uh, a property uh, which tells us the limit of the uh, resolution of the Fermi energy as a function of the luminosity, but also saying that my mismatch uh, probability should be 10% or lower. So what does uh, now the blue line mean? So if we are really in the first operation mode of Panda, the first years with the luminosity there, then with 90% probability uh, 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 of saying that I really identify the bound state uh, uh, properly, I can do that with a resolution for the Fermi energy of 0.4 MeV if the signal is rather large and about one MeV if it's maybe only 30 or 40 uh, nanobar. And the same is true for the other thing. So uh, the mismatch of virtual wrongly identified as a bound state, you have to say almost the same picture. Uh, the numbers are slightly different. Uh, and since this is only one model and you can have many, uh, you also need to say, okay, what is really my resolution which I get? And that's a number which is maybe easier to transport. And this is, uh, in principle, the smallest width which you can identify unambiguously with uh, free sigma. That means with 95% confidence level. And that tells you that a signal of 50 uh, nanobar can, uh, can uh, unambiguously identify a natural line width of 130 keV. If we go to the limit of the experiment later in, uh, in the operation with all equipment being online and un having understood the detector very well, this may go even to values well below 100 keV to identify the, the natural width of states. And this then can be in principle, uh, this in principle tells you that you then also can all the other models in the same way as I did for, for this <clears throat> particular model. But there is also the other uh, technique, and the other technique is um, Charmonium hybrid candidates in a recoil experiment. And how does a recoil experiment really look like in reality, or at least in theoretical reality, which is a contradiction per se, nevertheless? So you start out with a PBRP system, and in, here, in this case, if we take from the lattice, the 4.3 GeV exotic particle with one minus plus for JPC, then we need a recoil particle. And the recoil particle could be, for example, an eta. So we start out with eta, eta tilde C1, 
The eta goes to gamma gamma. So what does the, uh, the hybrid does? And also from uh, deductions from the lattice, uh, the, uh, the, the belief is that this object collapses by emitting a pi pi s wave to a normal, uh, to a normal meson. And using just this model, uh, 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 one comes to the point that, so we need a pi pi zero uh, system for the pi pi s wave. We do that because pi, pi, pi plus pi minus would have the row in it, and the row makes everything more complicated. So we go with the pi zero, pi zero. Then you have the chi sub C1 to get actually quantum numbers right. You have the de-excited uh, de CC bar system. And this de-excited CC bar system then has a radiative de decay to the J psi. So at the end, you come up with seven photons and a lepton pair. And this is actually the simplest explanation why we have this damn complicated and large calorimeter to actually not miss such channels. But since this is above DD bar threshold, we also have to be prepared that uh, this object also to decays to open charm. And so in principle, you also have to look into open charm pairs. And this is something which then complements the J psi analysis. So I show you some simulation results on both. So uh, that's, uh, for example, what our detector, if then com completed with all slices, uh, complete 4 pi detection and tuned uh, readout electronics and sensors that we can go to 20 MeV cutoff for the, for the uh, photons. Then you see here the nice eta signal. This is without background. Then you see here the chi sub C1 to J psi uh, gamma, the reconstruction uh, from the reconstructed tr tracks. And here you then see, and this is with background, uh, how we could uh, then, if there are no other crossing resonances in the Dalitz plot or the multidimensional phase space, you would see the hybrid uh, signal like that. The main handle here is the J psi. The J psi is a very unique tag of, these, uh, uh, of this experiment. So as soon as you have a J psi, you never have a problem with triggering. You get almost background free. This is not the case for the DD bar channels, but uh, that's a different story. So, and you see here the signal uh, over background, that means uh, sensitivity. Uh, uh, we can do uh, even for, uh, um, yeah, sorry. I, I, I don't, I got the slide from somebody else. I don't know what the last, line really means. But you see the quality of the signal, so I, I hope this uh, is convincing enough. And the same here for uh, DD bar, but that's all without background. Uh, you also see here the eta C1 going to D0, D0 bar. That's all made in the group uh, of Bochum uh, from colleagues from uh, Ulrich Wiedner. So, and finally, you can do something completely different, because there's also the D0 uh, DS0 2317, which was actually the first of these exotic or uh, at least believed exotic particles being found in Baba. It's an open charm system with strangeness, uh, which was so damn narrow that uh, uh, people believe that this uh, may be something different than the ordinary D sub S0, which uh, would be a zero plus plus state and to believe to be at 2400 something and therefore above all thresholds and therefore extremely broad like all scalars. Now we know that uh, you can uh, change the potential model in a way with chiral aspects that you actually get this particle back into the normal spectrum. Nevertheless, the ultimate test would be to compare, for example, its natural width also with models which may have a different uh, origin, maybe also multi-quark uh, aspects. And that means you have to really measure, again, here, the width of something. But unfortunately, this particle has open charm. And so you cannot directly produce that in P by P into formation, because you always have to do everything colorblind, flavorblind, and so on. But you could put another D, uh, D meson in. And so what you look is, for example, into the threshold uh, uh, excitation of a system of DS plus, DS0, star 2370 minus plus uh, charge conjugate, 
and then look into the excitation curve. And depending on the width of this 2317, this curve is either softer or uh, more cusp-like. Yeah? And uh, from that, you then can unfold uh, the width of this particle. And this has also been done in simulation. And this is a, is a very nice thing, which you can do also to a level of below 200 keV. So at the moment, uh, this is far away from what is actually mentioned at the, uh, as the uh, width of this particle. And it would be in the order of these decisive measurements uh, uh, which could distinguish uh, uh, a few models which are also playing in the ballpark of 100, 200, 300 keV. If it's really below that, then even we have to quit. Yeah? This, hmm? I'm almost through. So this brings me to the summary. Uh, the XYZ scans, uh, XYZ scans, which I showed, are already uh, accepted for publication. We just wait that EPGA brings it into the paper. So this is something which you can then uh, look into in more detail. It's a long write-up with all the details of this analysis. We also can do threshold scans, as I mentioned, in the same way, but then having two particles uh, uh, where one has to be extremely narrow, and then we can deduce the width of the other one. Uh, and we can do a very broad XYZ ser search with a recoil particle. And something which I did not mention here, uh, this is something which we did not work out, but uh, which is feasible. Using a deuterium target, we could use antiproton annihilation on a neutron, and by that, selecting the isospin explicitly to one. And so that would be a way to produce the Z states directly information and also with higher spins if they actually exist. Nobody knows. Yeah? And so we think the Panda setup is perfectly suited for all those measurements. We just have to complete it and to get antiprotons to do the job. And so we want data. Thank you very much. They all want coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't quite understand when you showed this reconstruction of the PD bars with either seed, and you, you said you used something to relax it. I didn't understand this part. What? what, what uh, uh, two slides in the back. The reconstruction where you showed. No, the, it, it, no, it's not uh, that we use it in reconstruction, but uh, there, there, was, uh, uh, there were papers on uh, hybrid decays. There are not very many about that. Yeah? There are old papers going back to the flux tube model of Iskur, uh, uh, which give you some ideas how things could uh, decay. But uh, this is uh, more modern, because they, what, they, what they did is they investigated how the wave function um, uh, develops on the lattice. And so they deducted from that that a decay of uh, uh, an isotropic emitting, emitting of a scalar wave might be a good candidate to look for these objects. I, I can look up the reference. And that's why we, for example, investigated this kind of decay channel. Yeah? You could also look for others. Uh, before that, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Typical idea was that you always look into eta plus charmonium to look for hybrids. Yeah? But this is then uh, a more complicated thing, and so we tried that for the simulation to have the worst case scenario. You're more convinced it's that before. What do you do with the PT bar in the annealer? What do you put in the reactor? First step, the annealer is anti proton, right? Yeah. Well, in the simulation to reconstruct the yeah, what you, what you do is um, uh, you don't uh, put any modeling into how proton-antiproton goes into that, because nobody knows that. So for the background, we, we take an event generator. For this kind of thing, we just say there is a certain amount of energy, and so we just let the event generator go and uh, produce this eta, eta C, one phase space distributed because we, we, uh, we don't know uh, what the production uh, uh, scheme would look like. So we do that also isotropically, because uh, uh, you can put angular distributions on top of that, but uh, uh, since nobody knows with, with which angular distribution it will be produced, uh, it doesn't make sense to put it in the simulation beforehand. Yeah. 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 Yeah.